yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. I was a freshman in nursing school when Pearl Harbor happened. Christmas came in the Battle of Bulge, and they packed us all up and shipped us across the country to uh, the German front. From 1941 to 1945, more than 16 million Americans said goodbye to their families, answering the call to arms during World War II. Fathers and mothers, sons and daughters, setting aside their careers, their dreams, convinced it was their duty confronting the spread of tyranny, defending democracy. I was drafted, but I volunteered. The forces of Germany have surrendered to the United Nations. Seventy years have come and gone since hostilities with Germany and Japan ended with their unconditional surrenders in 1945. Let us pray that peace be now restored to the world and that God will preserve it always. Today, those young gung-ho patriots are in their 90s. Their memories are fading. At an alarming rate, they're saying their final farewells. While roughly one million are alive today, including 28,000 calling Michigan home, the U.S. Veterans Administration keeps tabs on them sadly reporting 492 leave this world each day. Get to know the World War II veterans who walk among us and discover they are humble heroes. It's the best country. I enjoyed serving for it. And if I was able, I'd do it again. They don't want you to make a fuss over them. They served, they did their duty. But in so doing, they are a part of the fabric of American history national assets. View our World War II veterans in this light and consider how archivist Sir Arthur Doughty describes national assets. They are the gift of one generation to another, and the extent of our care of them marks the extent of our civilization. A country of millennials, Gen Xers, baby boomers, drawn to hear the oral history from what is widely considered the greatest generation. But there is reluctance, retelling the grim circumstance when, in an instant, a friend or comrade was struck down before their eyes, is often too painful to relive. Best to keep those flashbacks locked away no matter how excruciatingly they gnaw at the soul. And yet, these are the very recollections Dottie considers a gift, to be passed from one generation to the next and preserved with great care. There's an opportunity for World War II survivors to be honored and find closure. Southwest Michigan's Talons Out Honor Flight is a part of the nonprofit Honor Flight Network, providing flights to the nation's capital free of charge. At the World War II Memorial on the National Mall, Americans of all ages, races, and genders gather recognizing their sacrifice. Surrounded by cohorts, this is a comforting place. The National Park Service tells us this is where veterans' recollections come flooding back, triggered by the sight of dozens of battle names and military campaign designations carved into stone. At their side, a loving daughter, a son sharing what may be one final trip together, a final mission offering reflection and reunion. For everyone involved, this will be a mission accomplished. Talons out, honor flight. September 26, 2015, Kalamazoo Battle Creek International Airport, Kalamazoo, Michigan, 0430. Shuttle buses roll up to the curbside drop-off where volunteers give our travelers a hand. I can't say bright and early, very early morning, check in at the airport. We greet our veterans, and right from the moment they get there, they know how much they mean to us. We have volunteers, we have local military that come out. A family photo session preserving the moment. One, two, I like that smile. They get the national anthem before they get on the plane. We have a lot of fun, local entertainment, patriotic music. And then the day starts. Oh, my God. 
America. Bobby Bradley is president of Southwest Michigan's Talons Out Honor Flight. This is Mission 6, and with this mission, we've now taken over 430 veterans to Washington, D.C. Today, 75 World War II veterans, three of whom are women, are joined by seven Korean War and one Vietnam War veteran. Everyone is preparing for what will be an unforgettable experience. It's why Bradley started Talons Out Honor Flight. I lost my own dad about 10 years ago now, and this is something he would have loved. He was a Korean War vet. He didn't get to do this. So I started it for him, but I get paid in hugs. And once you've been on a flight and you see these men and women, it's for them. I mean, they are so humble. I can't tell you how many veterans have said, there's gotta be someone who deserves this more. You know, they don't think they deserve this, and they do. Each and every one deserves to have the honor that they get when they're here in D.C. and the honor and surprise that they're going to get when they get home. For the aircraft, can you please for it? All right, you have fun today. I shall. Thank you. Thank you. It's time to go side by side or with a gentle push from a guardian. Our honor flight crew makes its way down the jet bridge where there's a warm greeting at the aircraft door. Chartered commercial airliner is decorated in red, white, and blue. Once settled in, it's time to get acquainted with your neighbor and tell some old war stories. Oh, these are our heroes. Where you know we, you know, we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for these guys. It's like having all my dad back there. You know, a hundred of my dads. You know, it's uh, fantastic. I lost him five years ago, so this is a blessing to have all these guys back there. I love every one of them. Captain John Kerry explains to be assigned an honor flight is a top honor within the industry. This is number four. First one I did uh, Greenville, Spartanburg, and then I did uh, Milwaukee, and then I did Syracuse. This is a 6 a.m. departure. Washington, D.C.'s Reagan National Airport is our destination. Once again, about an hour and 15 minutes, we'll be cruising at 35,000 feet. We love each one of you, and we so much are honored to be around you. Each honor flight, a celebration of its passengers, and today, Captain Kerry's dad. I have his ring on here. He graduated from this in 1945, so in 46, when he was 18, he went over to Wiesbaden and uh, Germany and, uh, you know, grew up through the Depression, you know, like these, like these guys, uh, didn't own a toothbrush until he went in the Army. He never told me any stories. The anticipation is building for most. This will be their first visit to the World War II Memorial. As we begin our taxi, out on the tarmac, the Michigan Air National Guard's 110th Airlift Wing recognizes our honor flight and its passengers. The Kalamazoo Battle Creek International Airport Rescue and Firefighting Services shower us with a water cannon salute before takeoff. Lord, as you bless these men and women, the greatest generation, as they go on the flight today, may you bless them, keep them safe, bring them home safely tonight. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Well, I think it's a great honor to take Dad. I mean, the, the World War II veterans kind of didn't really get much when they came home. They were just, they came home and they said they put, put their military clothes away, got in their civilian clothes and went to work. And so I, I figured it's, it, it's about time they get their due, and being able to take dad is really something important to me. Yeah, I'd like to go. I want to go. I said, I got to stay in good health until Sunday. <laughs> I didn't know that he had submitted my name to go there. And all of a sudden, I get this notice you've been selected to go to Washington, D.C. for a day. And uh, for a day, what kind of deal is this? Clarence Hoppy Hopkins and son Kurt are a military family from Holland, Michigan. Clarence enlisted in the Coast Guard as the war escalated in the Pacific and Europe. He was following the lead of his older brother who had earlier joined up with the Army. Clarence stayed stateside after boot camp where he loaded bombs and shells onto ships. I suppose it was dangerous, but you know, as long as you didn't screw up, it was all right. Usually we were loading six Eight ships with 10,000 tons of ammunition, 24 hours a day we, we loaded ammunition. Sometimes we were on 12 on, 12 off. 
we always knew something was going to happen because out in Hampton Roads, there would be a hundred merchant ships. And these ships, as we'd load them, they'd put them out there and anchor them out there and they'd stay there and they couldn't, the crew couldn't come ashore or anything because they were ready to sail. And all of a sudden, the next morning, you'd come out and be nothing. Not a ship in the harbor. Well, you knew something was on going in. Like, we knew that in February of, on D-Day, that something was happening in February because there were whole hundreds of ships, all ships, all gone. And they'd make big convoys, 100, 200, maybe, in convoys, some big, some small, depends on where they were going and so on. Following in Dad's footsteps, Kurt ended up on board a Navy ammo supply ship, the Pyro. My draft number came up. I think it was my obligation. My father did his obligation in World War II, and it would be my obligation, even though that Vietnam turned out not to be a popular war, to go. And it's one of the things I'm, I'm very proud of. And it just so happens I end up on an ammunition ship after Dad loaded ammunition. And we spent our time running between the Philippines and Vietnam. And we passed ammunition to aircraft carriers and to destroyers along the coast. We never got to see any action, which was thankful, because being in an ammunition <laughs> ship, they don't let you get too close to the action. Oh, I'm excited. I know it's going to be uh, an emotional trip because uh, Dad will be at the World War II Memorial and I'd like to go to the Vietnam Memorial. I have a, a classmate, uh, Spencer Scott Freestone, and he got killed in Vietnam. You know, we, we just, our class, class of 65, just had their 50th reunion, and uh, we miss Scott. I'm taking a paper and pencil. I'm gonna do an etching of his name. I'd like to get the, the Vietnam one, because we had a, a good friend of Kurtz who was killed there, and, another, and I'd like to check some of the World War II, see if there's anything from this area that I would know. Because, of course, a lot of my high school graduates, college graduates and so on, were all killed during there was a bunch of them. And when I walk in the park and look at all those that I had here, and so, so I can't believe it. And you know, I, I almost got shipped out twice, but just for a luck of a good lord or something. I didn't get shipped out, and I should have. We got you something to commemorate your yeah. trip to Washington, D.C. It's a dog tag. It has your name, your rank, your serial uh -huh. number, Norfolk, Virginia, the Coast Guard insignia. And oh, that, that says, World War II veteran, the USA thanks you. And on the back of the big one, it says Talon's Out Honor Flight in the date. Oh, oh, thank you very much. And your kids and I got you a set. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> there it is. That's for you. And I can tell you, it's probably going to be, there'll be a lot of emotion tomorrow, probably the whole day. But going to be well worth it. This is something that I'll remember for as long as I'm alive and even after dad goes. That I got to spend this time with him. Excuse me. <laughs> Reagan National Airport, Arlington, Virginia, 0800. It's not just another Saturday morning at Reagan. The ground crew is well aware of the honor flight schedule, a half dozen today. They've planted military flags and snapped to attention as we taxi by. The welcome includes the traditional water cannon salute as we make our way to the gate. We thank you for your service and defending our country. We appreciate you and we thank you.
so many different emotions. Some are crying as soon as they see or hear the band. Um, some are just grinning ear to ear. You can see how proud they are to have served their country and most of them don't know that there's 100, 200, 300 people here greeting them. Ashley Walker is a 29-year-old volunteer. Shake their hands, give them a hug, welcome them, thank them for their service. It's all part of it. There's a special place in Walker's heart for these men and women, the reason a 29-year-old wakes up bright and early on a Saturday morning. My grandfather is a World War II veteran and he is 94 years old and I have been begging and pleading and trying to get him to come to D.C. But he's stubborn and says, no, no, I can't do it. So I pretend that each one of the vets that comes off the plane is him. And so I serve them and make their whole day special. And that's what it's all about is these guys and their service that they served our country. You know, I've never run into this. I, I was curious as we were walking up the, the terminal, I looked out into the tarmac and saw the flags. And I thought, well, that's nice and odd. I wonder what's going on. Then we started down the concourse and heard all the singing. We stopped to see what was going on. And it's, a, it's a, wonderful, uh, a wonderful show of appreciation. I was in the service during Vietnam. And when we came home, there was none of that. So it's, 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 it's wonderful to see people stopping and applauding and saying thanks. So many years have gone by since these guys served. It's, it's just a wonderful thing to see. Amber Scannell is catching a connecting flight to Indianapolis stopping just shorter for Gate to take this all in. I knew it was a celebration. I knew they were coming here to be honored. And that's the wonderful thing. It just brings me well up. <laughs> it's because they are being honored that they're here, that somebody cares for, for what they've done for us. And the music, I mean, it's just, it's just wonderful. And they deserve it so much and it just topped the week off. It began with one man, Earl Morris, who was a physician's assistant at the VA in the Columbus area. And after the memorial was built, he realized that many of his patients were at an age where they could not travel. Then he went and connected with another veteran and they did the same thing. So he went out to his pilot's club and said, we want to take veterans to DC. The one catch is you cannot charge them anything. You have to fly in your private plane. And that's how Honor Flight started. Six planes, six pilots, and 12 veterans were the very first Honor Flight. There are now over 132 hubs nationwide in 43 states that do what we do. We provide all expense paid trips to Washington DC uh, for our World War II veterans and our terminal ill veterans from other conflicts. To date, as a whole, the network has taken over 150,000 veterans to Washington, D.C. Southwest Michigan's Talons Out Honor Flight is one of the hubs getting its start just a couple of years ago. We actually saw a movie called Honor Flight the Movie, which is a documentary that follows a hub out of Milwaukee. And I knew I wanted to be involved. I reached out to two friends that I knew and also my brother-in-law to be a part of the board, and we got established. Um, and we called the people in the movie and said, hey, we want to learn how to do this. Are you guys willing to teach us? We went and spent a weekend with them and they showed us from the ground up what to do. And it's just been jumping on with both feet and going. And here we are two years later. Talons Out receives donations as small as 10 and as large as $10,000, helping to fund the Adopt a Veterans program. $500 pays for a veteran's entire trip, including visits to the World War II Memorial, Arlington National Cemetery, and the changing of the guard. There are stops at the Korean War Memorial, the Vietnam Wall, the Marine Corps, and Air Force War Memorials. This is very therapeutic for a lot of our veterans. That's one of the things that we try to stress to them is now that you've been here and you've been with men and women who experienced what you did, stories start to come out that they've never talked about before. And we encourage them to go back and share with their families because this is a living legacy for their children and their children's children. And they need to know what their fathers and grandfathers and grandmothers did for their freedom. After basic training, I went into a ASTP program to start with at the University of Florida. But because they needed men on the front, 
uh, they washed the whole class out after one semester. And I was assigned to the 94th Infantry Division. And we trained for about six months, intensive training. And then they shipped us overseas. And the, the whole division went overseas on the Queen Mary and big ship. And, and that was quite an experience in itself. My rank we got to PFC is all I got in the 94th Infantry Division. In 1944, Army Private First Class Moxon was stationed in France. We were uh, assigned to, to start with on the west coast of France, and the whole division was situated around these ports on the west coast that they were not taking over, just uh, holding them in siege for two or three months. And then Christmas came and the Battle of the Bulge, and they packed us all up and shipped us across the country to uh, the German front. On December 16, 1944, Germany launches a massive armored attack against Allied forces, holding positions in the dense Belgian forest of Ardennes and Luxembourg. After D-Day, this was Adolf Hitler's last chance to drive the Allies out of Western Europe. An armored assault designed to split the Allied armies, creating a bulge in the American, British, and French line of defense. We got involved then and eventually, and when I got wounded, it was the start of the counterattack to push the Germans back. In his journal, Moxon details what happened next. I and two or three rookies were faced with the obstruction of an anti-tank ditch, which was 10 feet wide and 8 to 10 feet deep with straight sides. We were looking for a way to cross to get out of the line of fire as we could hear the bullets popping around us. I found a fallen tree in the ditch and slid down the trunk. As I turned around at the bottom, I apparently tripped an anti-personnel mine and it blew me about 10 feet down the ditch. The first sensation was a complete numbness of my right leg and I thought that my leg was gone. I found it still attached. A buddy of my squad jumped down and cut my pants open at the knee. A stream of dark blood was streaming out which indicated a severed main vein. My buddy got a tourniquet on it to stop the bleeding. Then after I got wounded of course, they uh, went through MASH <laughs> hospital in the field and was uh, then shipped back to a hospital in England where I recuperated and eventually came back to the States because the war then ended. 75,000 Americans died at the Battle of the Bulge. It was a costly victory, but one that set the stage for Germany's surrender. Moxon's contribution rewarded with a combat infantryman's badge, a bronze star, and a purple heart. I've worked with people that are veterans and, you know, we just owe them so much. And, uh, freedom means a lot to me and all of our, you know, gifts that we are given by that. I know where I'm going and I know the police know where they're going. So have no fear, Kevin is here. That being said, a couple quick rules. In case of emergency, the preferred method exit coach is out the front door the way you guys came in. Those feeling extremely energetic can use these roof hatches. <laughs> just kidding. But yes, they are roof hatches. All right, we are ready. We go. are ready, and I'll continue in just a minute. Sit back, Jenny. relax, enjoy the ride. It's my honor to be here with you guys today, truly. Yeah. So I appreciate your service, and we're rolling. So let's roll. We can wave goodbye to our uh, local volunteers. We even got a helicopter escort. There we go. Reagan National Airport, Arlington, Virginia, 0900. We depart for Arlington National Cemetery. Five charter buses roll through D.C. traffic, complete with a police escort. And, and you'll, see, you'll see as we uh, get, travel around today that all these cars, it'll just be a laughing stock because they don't realize that all these five buses are, are part of this police escort. Iconic sights of D.C. line our route leading up to the drive down Memorial Avenue. All right, our first stop's going to be Arlington National Cemetery. When you see the house sitting on top of the big hill, that house was built as a living memorial to George Washington. Spread across 624 acres, more than 400,000 service members have made these green rolling hills their final resting place. 
The land that is now Arlington National Cemetery once belonged to George Washington Park Custis, grandson of Martha Washington, a step-grandson of George Washington. The property would be the subject of a tax dispute, but eventually purchased by the federal government, Arlington's historians explain by the third year of the Civil War, the increasing number of fatalities was outpacing the burial capacity of Washington, D.C. cemeteries. To meet this demand, 200 acres of Arlington Plantation was set aside as a military cemetery. The first military burial took place on May 13, 1864, for Private William Christman of Pennsylvania. On June 15, the War Department officially designated this burial space a national cemetery, thus creating Arlington National Cemetery. By the end of the war, burials included thousands of service members as well as African-American freedmen. Today, our group joins the millions who each year pay tribute, remembering service members who sacrificed. Boy Scouts visiting today form a line to thank our veterans before making the trek up the hill to visit the tomb of the unknown soldier and witness the changing of the guard. The tomb of the unknown soldier is guarded 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. As described by Arlington officials, the relief commander conducts a detailed white glove inspection of the weapon, checking each part of the rifle once. Then the relief commander and the relieving sentinel meet the retiring sentinel at the center of the matted path in front of the tomb. All three salute the unknown who have been symbolically given the Medal of Honor, the unknown known but to God. A survivor of World War II, former Congressman Bob Dole, was badly injured in 1944 when his army unit attacked a German machine gun nest in northern Italy. Today, like those Boy Scouts at Arlington, Dole was a scout from Russell, Kansas during the Great Depression. A war hero, Dole spends his Saturdays at the World War II Memorial greeting his brothers and sisters in arms. He is out at the World War II as often as he can be. Um, this was actually a small Saturday. We had about five or six flights come in. On a super Saturday, they've had as high as 20 to 25 flights come in, and he will sit out there in his chair and greet every veteran and talk to every veteran that wants to shake his hand and get their picture taken with him. They sidle up to his left and to his right for a few words and a photo. Some sneak in a kiss. He's amazing, and he's here all the time. Every time I come here to the World War II Memorial, Bob Dole is here, and um, he's a legend. Uh, he's here to greet these veterans as well, and he himself is a veteran, of course, and um, I think it means so much to the veterans. I always see them lining up uh, to, to shake his hand and, and take pictures with him, and I know it's a touching moment for them and their families. Michigan U.S. Representative Justin Amash from Cascade Township has also stopped by to say hello. Well, it's the least we can do. I'm a representative in Congress, and we want to show our appreciation for these veterans. It's very touching, and a lot of times you have families where uh, you have a veteran son and a veteran father, and it's a meaningful trip for both of them. It's just something that means a lot to me as an American. The World War II Memorial was dedicated on May 29, 2004. At either end of its oval footprint stand two 43-foot-tall pavilions signifying American victory in the Pacific and European theaters. Fifty-six granite columns represent a nation of 48 states, seven federal territories, and the District of Columbia standing united. The bronze ropes bind the columns and bronze oak and wheat wreaths exemplify America's industrial and agricultural backbone. And yes, Kilroy was here. At the center of the memorial is the Rainbow Pool, where Talons Out visitors gather at its edge for a group photo. Trail Life USA Scouts lead in the singing of the national anthem. I served in the motor pool 
and the 833rd Engineers. And I was in London, England, France, Germany, and the whole bit. In Normandy, there was a soldier laying there with a ring on his finger with a picture of his girlfriend or somebody. <laughs> yeah, it was the worst thing I ever saw. It always sticks with me for some reason. It's just been fun to relive different experiences with him that I've really never known through his eyes. And it makes you see things differently. It's just makes you know him, what kind of a real person that he is. He's always been very quiet and very uh, reserved. And uh, when you learn some of the things that he had to be a part of and some of the things that he had to do, it makes you look at him a little bit differently. We've had some of our men killed. And I've had some close ones that I haven't seen in the real combat. I had one guy killed beside of me one night with a sniper. And that's mostly what we had. Going through Arlington Cemetery was an emotional thing because the cemetery reminds him a lot of the cemetery that he saw in Europe where a lot of his friends lay and a lot of his people that he was at the war with. And he was there to protect those people and uh, he got to be friends with a lot of, of those people. But he said the day that the war ended, the German soldiers, they were just like all of our soldiers. They came up and shook each other's hands and talked to each other just like they had been friends all the time. And they were just trying their best to serve their country. It's the best country. I enjoyed serving for it. And if I was able, I'd do it again. It's been great. He can still wear his uniform at uh, almost 95 years old, and that hasn't changed. Um, and he's worn it in every Memorial Day parade for 28 years. All of us kids growing up, you know, he drove an old truck and wore his uniform. I think that this will be a uh, I don't want to say an end to, or, or uh, you know, end to his story, but it'll be a closure, I think, for him. Because, you know, when he got home from the war, he got off a train and there was no one there. No one. And all those years that go by where, you know, they don't get recognition for a lot of that. And this is, you know, he's getting recognized today. And I love it. Well, this is great. This is one of the greatest things I ever had. <laughs> I've enjoyed every bit of it. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Children. There are children. I mean, today there was a little girl, maybe 12 to 18 months old, running up to our veterans and shaking their hands. The kids that come out, the parents that come out, Boy Scouts, Trail Life Scouts, I mean, and they are just overwhelmingly thanking our veterans and they just don't know what to do because they've never been thanked. And it's, it's amazing to watch it and to see how DC and the visitors here and the people who live here open their arms for our veterans. Well, it was, it was good to see Dad get excited about all the people that were there to meet him. I think it kind of surprised him. And it made me feel good that, that people came out to honor World War II veterans who haven't gotten their due. The same can be said of Vietnam War veterans like Son Kurt. His day is layered with emotions, spending time with and honoring his father while also being honored himself as a Vietnam survivor. And there's the visit to the Vietnam Veterans Memorial, where more than 58,000 names are etched this is where Kurt so desperately seeks closure. When you see the wall, it, it's, it's kind of intimidating to see that these are all the people that have died in Vietnam. And then I walked down and I found Scott and I took a picture of it and I did a rubbing of his name. 
had a little conversation with him and it was important to me anyway, after being a Vietnam veteran, to do that. I touched his name and I just told him <clears throat> I'll remember him, he'll never be forgotten. And I explained to him we just had our 50th class reunion and that his name was brought up and that we honored him and just pray to God he's in a better place. I'll never forget him. Never. Women in Military Service for America Memorial, Washington, D.C., 1400 hours. Dating back to the American Revolution, nearly two million women have enlisted with the armed forces, dedicating themselves to the defense of freedom. At the ceremonial entrance to Arlington National Cemetery, this is where the nation recognizes all women who have served in or with the United States Armed Forces, past, present, and future. That's the mission of the Women in Military Service for America Memorial. This is a space for documenting the experiences of women and telling their stories of service, sacrifice, and achievement. And on this day, Pawpaw, Michigan's Eleanor Dunlop's story is documented in what's known as The Register, a computerized database. Her face, her story, unveiled on the museum's big screen. Through the mail, I heard about the Women's Memorial and uh, that if I wanted, I could, you know, send my picture in and tell my thing, and so I did. And uh, so that's how come I was on there. To see my mom up on the wall, you know, and to have them give this to her, Wonderful. My mother is a saint. And everybody says that. I, I feel that. So I see my mom. We talk all the time on the telephone. It's not like I don't see her. Um, but to do something like this, this is really special. I'm a vet. She served in World War II. This is like a really special thing. So I'm, I'm thrilled that I'm here. I was a freshman in nursing school when Pearl Harbor happened. And uh, when, after I graduated and got my RN, I enlisted and was at Camp McCoy in Wisconsin. We had strict orders. You do not smile at your patient because they were POWs. After Victory in Europe Day, there was a need for replacement nurses in the European theater. Hundreds of RNs like Dunlop gathered at Chicago's Union Station and shipped out. I was assigned to uh, outside of Paris. We had a 50th field hospital there and I went to the operating room there in Paris. And, but since the war was over what we did was emergency cases and things like that. One of those cases involved a machine gunner who'd fought the Germans at the Battle of the Bulge. His unit had gone home and so he decided to re-enlist and he asked for the operating room. So I taught him sterile technique. <laughs> That guy in the operating room that she taught how to do it, that became my father. So they met because he busted his knee up, his, his whole troop went home, he had to stay, he got pneumonia, he couldn't go. And then he meets her and they have a family of five kids and papa. How does that happen? At the Women's Memorial, watching them get their folio keepsake, they were stunned. They were excited and they were thrilled to be recognized because so many women aren't. I mean, it just, and the men get excited to go through the Women's Memorial and know that those women that were there supporting them as nurses and in, in, in the WASPs and the different positions that they held, that they're getting the recognition that they also deserve because it, it was a very different time and women did not get recognized the way they do today. My grandfather, fought in World War II in, in the Pacific Ocean and when he was toward the end of his life and we wanted so badly to, to just know a little bit more about it. That's what I hope comes out of a trip like this is that this group of veterans will maybe open up and let family members know as much as they can because it's American history and when they're gone, it's gone. When I have noticed that there's a lot of opening up happening here. Today has been an incredible experience to be with my father all day. 92 years old, been through a great experience in the war that he couldn't talk about for about 50 years. And now, it's been longer than that now, but he's able to tell his story about what happened because of the OSS was so secret. But to spend an entire day with my father has been incredible. I was drafted, but I volunteered. 
the OSS was a strictly a volunteer organization. Uh, you volunteered to go into France, you volunteered to go to China. The Office of Strategic Services, OSS, that was the predecessor to the CIA and the Special Forces. We went behind enemy lines to disrupt uh, German and Japanese forces. We did espionage work, spy work, and uh, we blew up things. We captured a hydroelectric plant, but uh, various things. It was a physical and psychological endeavor. We tried to confuse the enemy as much as possible and cause them to divert troops the way they weren't needed in order for our regular troops to come in and take over. Capturing the hydroelectric plant, that was a massive endeavor, something like the Hoover Dam that we captured with 18 of us and up to 200 French underground. Well, the rest was a lot of fun. We made friends with the French and did a lot of ambush work and had a lot of parties because the French were so happy to see the Americans that they brought wine, beer, and cheese. And we had a high whole time as well as having a fun fighting the Germans. The Aiguillon France hydroelectric plant is located about 100 miles south of Paris. The object of holding the hydroelectric plant was because the southern invasion of France needed electricity and we supported the southern invasion. So when the, when the southern invasion overran us then we had to get out. And then we volunteered to go to China and we trained 200 Chinese commandos and jumped in. There were 16 of us in China. We jumped in with them and we had to try to prevent the Japanese from removing the rice from the Hanyang, Pouching, Changsha rice triangle. That was like the breadbasket of China. So we were 600 miles behind Jap lines and none of us expected to come out alive because we didn't look like Orientals and we were taller than the other ones and we couldn't speak their language. So that was a little uh, hairy at times. When the war ended, we were still in China. We had to stay 30 days longer than the war was over because the Japanese all weren't surrendering. So our war lasted a little longer. You know, when you're 19 or 20 years old, you can conquer the world. Just ask Lawrence of Arabia. He was only 18 or 19 when he was doing that. But when you're young, you can do anything. What caught me off guard was, was going to these sites, sites that I've been to before, but seeing it in a whole different way. So I thought I had seen the changing of the guard before, but I really hadn't ever seen it like I saw it today with these veterans that were here and a part of it. And same for the World War II Memorial. It's a beautiful memorial. It's a, it's a beautiful place. It's an amazing place. There's definitely a sense of history there. But when you have the people that storm the beaches of Normandy, they're with you looking at it. It's a whole different experience. The Honor Flight experience is providing opportunities to cleanse the soul, reflect, and reminisce. Their stories shared are like family heirlooms to be retold or transcribed in a journal, passed down from one generation to the next. As a nation, theirs is a gift of American antiquity. My name is Ivan Sheck. I was a motor machinist mate, second class. My serial number was 316. 55326. I served on an LST during the latter part of the war, and after the war was over, I served on an AOG 56. I graduated from high school and moved to work in a shop and worked there about five months and made a couple of friends, and all three of us joined the Navy all together. We went to Great Lakes for boots, and second week we were in boots, we got three shots one day in the arm and I reacted to one of them. I ended up in sick bay. They put me in a measles ward. So once I was in a measles ward, you're there for 14 days. When I got out, of course, my company had moved out. So I got assigned to a new company and I never saw my friends again. They went to the Pacific. And when I graduated, I went to the European theater. My dad's never really talked a whole lot about his experience in the war. Even though we've asked, he's really never said much. Going through the application process was awesome because he shared so much with me that I've never known before. And then I've in turn been able to share that with the rest of the family who have just said this is awesome because we finally have heard dad's story. It's been kind of emotional for me because to just see the honor that people bestow upon our veterans is heartwarming to me. So that's just been um, very overwhelming. It's probably the only time I'm ever gonna do this. 
for Dad. It's been special. It really has. I've enjoyed the whole trip. We've had a good time together. Just a, a father-son bonding. It's a trip I think everybody should make. I mean, it really brings things into perspective. To see the World War II Memorial, to see the Vietnam, and you get to see the Korean, the Air Force, and Iwo Jima. It's, it's been an experience that I'll remember forever. It's, it's just been a wonderful trip. Like I say, I probably won't do it again. Maybe we will. Maybe, I don't know, it'll depend on Dad. But it, it, it's something that everybody should do. Speak for the veterans and saying, yes, we do appreciate the endeavor that's uh, been put forth. We appreciate your love. A lot of people appreciate what we did. Maybe more than we think. We sort of think that patriotism is fell by the wayside. This restores your faith in humanity. Be thankful for the freedom you have and be ready to defend it. Reagan National Airport, Arlington, Virginia, 1700 hours. It's been a long day for these old soldiers. It's time to say farewell to well-wishers and some new friends. Pack it in and head home. Once on board the aircraft and at a cruising altitude of 30,000 feet, Bobby makes an announcement. Well, for you veterans, way back in World War II, we know your letters from home were very, very important to you. So for you today, we have your very own mail call. We actually have a gentleman whose mother and father wrote letters to him in 1945. They bounced around Europe. He never saw them. The family has found them and are presenting him with those today on his way home. <laughs> the gentleman is Army Private First Class Milton Moxon, the young man injured during the Battle of the Bulge. I was just overcome. I, I, I couldn't hold my emotions in place. These were a great surprise. Of course, we dated the letters of January 1st, and I got wounded February 2nd. During between that time, we were in combat off and on, so no mail was delivered. I guess they lost track of us. Of course, after I was wounded, then I was checked at different points, and then they never caught up with me. It says in the letters that they crossed the ocean four times, trying to catch up with my dad in the field. When he was wounded and came back, they were traveling back and forth, trying to catch up to him wherever he was, and you know, either on the battlefield or in the hospital. At some point in time, my grandparents gave those letters to my parents. We found them in a box in the attic when they moved from their home to the retirement village in Grand Rapids. And we've been in possession of them since then. My mother, she was a very prolific writer to me, I mean, to uh, her children. She'd tell me how much she prayed for me and hoped that I would come through okay. There was always letters of encouragement and uh, love, of course, involved. December 31st, 1944. Dearest Milton, I'll just send you one more greeting this year. My thoughts are ones traveling your way and I breathe a prayer every so often for your welfare. Of course, you must realize that after all that has taken place over there the past couple of weeks, we can't be but deeply concerned about you. We have no way of knowing where you are, though we think you are with the Third Army. To say the least, you must have seen active combat enough for a lifetime. It must be terrible to see comrades wounded and killed around you. Torture to soul and body mental and physical. How can men endure so much? And my own dear boy, one of them, too weary and distressed even to pray sometimes. But God understands. Who was it in the Old Testament that God said to, why do you call so loudly? And he had never moved his lips. It was because his soul cried out in agony. That is how easily God hears. Only a sigh or a sob and God's telegraphy records it. His Holy Spirit is constantly in touch with our spirit when we are his children, and that's always an open line to reach God's ear. There is never any busy signal on that line. Well, dearest, I must go now. May God bless you and keep you. Love from us all. Mom.
Just knowing my dad, it would really be this voice from the past. Through all of this and recalling all of his service and the things that he was going through and then getting this letter and hearing his mom talking about praying for him and sharing scripture with him and just her heart for the boys, all the boys, and praying for all the boys would, would just be a remembrance of her love and my grandfather's love for my dad just kind of coming back out of the past. We knew that would be really significant for him. She was a patient person, just a loving mother, good mother. We missed her a great deal. I'm going to read him in private and uh, let my emotions carry me where they will. When my dad signed up for the honor flight, we wanted to try to do something special for him, and we thought this would be a way to really honor him. And as my wife began going through those letters and putting them in chronological order, she came across these letters. Most of the letters were from my dad written back home, but she came across these two letters that were written by his parents and sent to him. And we thought this would be just a really unique way for him to get a letter from his parents 70 years after the war. This will be a memory I'll carry to my grave, I'll tell you. It was terrific, just terrific. Very special mail call back here this evening. We had a gentleman who just received some letters that has taken 70 years to get to him. His family found letters from his parents written to him in 1945 and they were included in his mail call today. So Honor Flight is thrilled and proud to be a part of this special delivery. We hope the rest of you enjoyed your mail call. We'll be heading home here soon. And the ladies are going to see if you need any drinks or anything real quick, but we should be wrapping it up and landing very soon, I think. Kalamazoo Battle Creek International Airport, Kalamazoo, Michigan, 2100 hours. Talon's Out Honor Flight Mission 6 has arrived home safely. And I think it was really good for a lot of those men to have that welcome back. Kalamazoo Air Zoo, Kalamazoo, Michigan, 2200 hours, homecoming. More than 3,000 assemble celebrating the men and women who gave of themselves when a nation needed them most. I have my daughter Sarah and then these are friends of ours. This is Dawson and Jada and Gavin Thrash. Hello. I think it's a really emotional experience. It's giving me the chills and I think we're all out here to support these men who gave so much of themselves, of their families and it's just awesome to see all these people out here tonight. Well, I think that it's just a lot of family just coming together and we're all supporting the veterans for fighting for our country and I think that's really special to everybody here and it really touches the heart. I look at the pictures and I smile. I, I said, we had a good time. He, he was happy, he smiled and he said, never shook so many hands in all my life. Since then, anybody that he met, he told them about the trip and he always had a smile on his face when he was talking about it. And it was just great to see that he really enjoyed it because it made me feel good that I could take him on that trip. We got back on the 26th and about three weeks later, on October 19th, Dad passed away. And I believe Dad was the second or third one from that group that has, that has passed since then. We got a call saying that Dad was in the hospital. We all went up and we got to see him and say goodbye and then he passed away one day before his 96th birthday. They say that there's certain things in your life that set your life apart and I think this is going to be one of mine that I had the honor of taking dad on this trip and it really meant a lot to me to do something for dad for all he's done for me. The dog tags help me remember him every day and I've been wearing them. I know it's right there, you know, that, and I'll, I'll take dad's and I might, I might even wear his. He had one more thing to do in his life that turned out to be what it was. And I'm just, it was a pleasure and an honor to be part of it.
To order a copy of Mission Accomplished, Talons Out Honor Flight, call 1-800-442-2771 or order online at gvsu.edu slash wgvustore.